Okay. Okay. Um, I mentioned, I talked just a second ago about how important the routine is. Um, and the routine is, it's very important for our loved ones to have a routine to get set, you know, set in their ways, basically. It's what it is. But I think it's much more important for the families to have this routine. Um, because your loved one's going to be successful in this routine, and that's going to be less stress for you as the family. Um, or the caregiver, primary caregiver, whoever is taking care of them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, your loved one's going to be able to function better. Are they going to remember, especially later on in the disease, um, that they need to eat breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning? No. They're not going to remember that. But they're, it's going to be a familiar thing to them. You know, they won't be able to tell you, oh, it's 8, it's time for breakfast. Um, but it's going to be familiar. Their routine will be familiar. And it'll help alleviate some um, hard-to-manage behaviors that can come up, um, whether it's sundowning, you know, that late evening, <clears throat> late afternoon, early evening time. Um, sometimes people with dementia get very agitated, um, very restless. Well, if they're in this routine that you've been doing for years now, you might alleviate some of that, or you might not ever even have to deal with sundowning, because they already got a routine going, you know what we're doing. Um, and it also helps combat an empty day. Um, an empty day is a bored day. We've all had boring days where we just sat in front of the TV and did nothing. Um, and, and I know it's easy, especially when we're caring for our loved one, because we as caregivers have got a lot of stuff to do during the day. So I know it's easy when Dad loves to sit in front of the TV and watch Westerns all day. And it's easy to let him do that. It is, because you can do all the stuff that you need to do and get all that done. But we also have to realize that that's um, not stimulating our loved one. And it can be somewhat detrimental, especially later on in the evening if they've been bored all day long and then they are um, want to do something later on and they don't know how to express that as well. So they might become a little bit more combative, a little more agitated um, as well. So we want to keep them stimulated and involved in life. Um, so we don't want to just pop them in front of the TV. So there are activities that you want to place into the day. And when I say activities, I'm not saying you have to come up with a creative um, activity every single day, like doing a scrapbook or putting together you know, a model airplane. So what I'm talking about, I'm talking about um, just everyday activities, whether it is folding laundry, gardening, sweeping the porch, um, starting uh, dinner, starting dinner, getting everything out of the refrigerator that you're going to need and putting it out, setting the table, activities like that, everyday activities. Um, everything you do can be turned into an activity for our loved ones as well. We want to make sure to keep them very active um, in everything that we do every single day for that as well. And in the earlier stages, it's just suggest activities or remind them to take their meds um, because it is important to keep our loved ones to focus on what they can do instead of what they cannot do. Um, so we don't think, well, goodness, mom has dementia. We're just going to have to start doing everything for her right now. We're just going to have to take over her life and let her not do anything because she has dementia, she'll do it wrong. Well, that's not true. They can still do many, many things. They can still fold laundry. They can still, depending on what stage they are in the disease, they can probably um, still cook dinner for themselves. They just might need a little um, help on the, an appropriate diet, making sure that they're eating nutritional stuff instead of just Cheetos and Hot Pockets. You know, something like that. But they're just letting them do everything that they can still do. They can still cook, let them still cook. If they can still go out in the garage and fiddle around with their tools, let them do that in a safe environment, of course. Um, but even so, and as the disease progresses, we might then we have to start adding in a little bit more structure. Maybe we're just watching while they're doing their activities to make sure it is safe. Um, maybe we have to start activities for them. It could be that they want to do the activity, they just don't remember. They don't remember how to start. We would always, my mom would always cross stitch uh, or make blankets, crochet, that's the word I'm looking for, she always crochet. Um, and earlier on, she, you know, she would just leave it out and she would constantly do it. She's watching TV or doing whatever. She would just sit there and make those blankets. Well, later on, uh, I started noticing Mom was not doing that as often. So I would ask her. I would say, Mom, do you, have you been making your blankets lately? I would really um, like for you to make me a blanket for Christmas. Um, something like that. So I would remind her, and she was like, oh, that's a good idea. And she would get it out and do it. So I just had to remind her of that. She's still, still something she liked to do. Um, sometimes you just need to remind them to help them out and get them started on it. And then the later stages of the disease, depending on what their physical or functioning abilities are, um, it could be that they're just in the kitchen and you're talking to them while you're making dinner. So they're still part of the home. Uh, they might not be able to help as much, 
but they're still a part of the home, part of everything that's going on. Um, the routine, I also want to just say, to go ahead and start scheduling your rush turn breaks in the routine also. Um, this is going to help out later on in the disease. If there is ever an incontinence problem or an accident problem, if they're already used to going to the restroom every two hours, I can alleviate some of that pretty easily. There's a story I know a lady, she um, she takes her mother to her day program every single day because her the daughter takes care of the mother and the daughter still works, so she goes to her day program from 7 till 6 every single day. Well, um, the lady, she works in the school district, so she had summer. She had a couple of uh, months off in the summer. And she didn't take her mom for two weeks. She didn't take her mom to the day program. And she came back and she was talking to me. She's like, I've noticed mom has just been so much more agitated lately. She would get really, really mad at me towards the end of the day. She would be real restless. She'd want to get up and start moving stuff around. And she would just fight with me on everything. It's just not like her. And I sat down and I said, well, has there been anything different in what you all been doing? She said, well, we've just been at home the past couple of weeks, going along. And, it's, and I thought, and I was like, oh, so your mother hasn't been coming to the day program, which she's been used to, been, to doing for years now, maybe, for maybe even a year, just a year they've been coming to it. And she was like, and I said, you know what, she interrupted her routine. Her routine's been interrupted, and she didn't know quite how to handle that. She can't handle that as well, because she has dementia, so she's, that's how she's communicating. Sometimes the behaviors, well, sometimes all times, the behaviors are a type of communication. So getting more agitated and restless because her routine was interrupted. Just a good example. In the more middle um, to moderate stages of the disease, there will be more, you'll notice more good days and bad days. We all have good days and bad days. Um, but they'll be a little bit more noticeable on our loved ones. The sleep pattern will change, that 24 hour rhythm clock, it just gets off. So maybe they don't sleep all the way through the night. Maybe they wake up every hour on the hour. Uh, maybe they get up at 3 o'clock every morning and they want to put their clothes on and go to work. It's that sleep pattern. It's just not quite. And again, it's what so we can think about what's happening to the brain. It's just a symptom of the disease. It's not that they're doing all the stuff on purpose, that they're repeating themselves, they're getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning just to irritate you. Um, it's what's happening in the brain. They can't control it. Because you'll also start to notice more difficult behaviors will start to occur, and they'll occur more often. So whether it is they do become more agitated, maybe they start to wander a lot more. Um, the sundowning can start happening. I just told you about that. They'll just get more restless towards the end of the day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and again, these behaviors are a form of communication because they're not able to communicate with their words as well. Um, they're less able to manage their environment around them. Um, but things still affect them. They still can get upset about things or happy about things. And just how to display that usually will come up in a behavior. Um, they may not recognize familiar people, or they'll confuse people as well. So they might confuse a daughter and a mother because they look alike. They can confuse them that way as well. Um, and more surprises will happen. More surprises like um, you're at dinner at a restaurant and mom takes out her dentures and just puts them on the plate right next to her. Because you don't want dentures on your own plate, right? So you don't want to be here and see them on somebody else's plate. It makes sense. <laughs> so those are surprises and they can be funny um, and they can be upsetting as well, but usually we just have to laugh at them. We've got to. Um, but as the family unit and friends and caregivers, you've got to start developing these to uh, coping skills and tools. Which is, and a lot of this comes into how do we communicate with our loved ones. There's ways to communicate with them, validate their feelings, um, redirect them. <clears throat> Excuse me, body language and tone of voice. There's ways to communicate and how we interact with our loved one will make the situation better or worse. And we've got to learn how to develop those tools and skills to help do that. Um, and also preventing some of these difficult behaviors. There are ways to prevent or avoid some of them as well. And it's just getting more education and learning about those tools, schools, skills and tools. We're also going to have to realize we're going to have to start asking for help. Um, especially if you're doing this on your own or you're living with that person. And it's just you. You've got to start asking for help because you cannot do it. Nobody can be a caregiver 24-7. You just flat out can't. You've got to have some help. Whether it's from a sibling or a spouse or you hire some help to come in also. But 
but just realizing that you're not Superman, you can't do it all on your own. And having the courage to ask for help. And knowing what's out there as well. Um, in some of the stuff, there's an emotional adaptation that comes with dementia. You can't take it personally. Because sometimes um, they can say mean things. For instance, let's say you're sitting there next to your mom. And you're sitting there and y'all are just watching TV. And you start smacking your gum. Maybe you're not aware of it. You just start smacking your gum, popping bubbles, something like that, and then mom just reach back and slap you in the face. Now that could be upsetting, especially if she's never done it before. Now she did it all the time, um, but especially if she's never done it before, right? That can be very upsetting. Why would mom just hit me? Well, more than likely, you were really annoying because she kept smacking the pop of your gum, and she didn't have the capabilities to say that out loud. She just knew that she was annoyed, and she was going to stop it. That was her way of stopping it. Mm -hmm. But it can be upsetting for the caregiving and family unit. But just know it, we've got to laugh about some of this stuff. And we've got to give a gap as well. Because things happen. Things do happen. Um, job finances will, um, changes will occur uh, for the caregivers as well. Maybe as a caregiver, you're not able to take that promotion that you wanted, but you got offered. Or you might have to cut down the part time hours. Um, or some of you didn't get the raise you wanted because you were gone so much from doctor's visits and staying home with mom when she got sick, something like that. Just being aware that that stuff will change, um, especially if you're the primary caregiver for your loved one. It starts to get expensive, and it can be embarrassing. And just learning how to stay calm with all of that. In the later stages of the disease, uh, the more advanced stages, our loved one, they might not recognize family members they might not recognize themselves. The gross um, and motor skills can be affected. Maybe they can't button their buttons anymore. They're not able to hold their head up as well anymore on their own. Um, and we can think about it, the brain is um, only able to take in so much, to, uh, only to take care of so much part of the body because it's been damaged so severely throughout the course of the disease. It can only take care of the vital parts of the body. You can think of it that way. Um, so they're going to need total 24-hour care for all activities that they were living, which is the dressing, the eating, the bathing, the grooming. They will need help with all of that stuff because they won't exactly remember how to do it. And maybe physically they're not able to do it for themselves either <clears throat> also. And in all of the family, you know, we provide care. We provide love, touch, massage, talking to them, still living, you know, still talking to them, involving them in life. They may or may not talk back to you, um, but just still having them be a part of the home and be a part of the life. Palliative and hospice care are very um, helpful at this time. And really what it is is they're not treating palliative care, they're not treating the disease, because you can't unfortunately treat dementia or Alzheimer's disease, but they're treating the symptoms of it. They're making sure that they feel okay. They feel good. You know, maybe they have a fever, they're making sure the fever's down. That they're not in pain, something like that. So they have a good quality of life, basically, um, to do all that. There's this theory of retrogenesis, um, and it's not a perfect theory, of course, um, but it, I think it helps kind of understand what's going on. But the brain of somebody with Alzheimer's disease deteriorates in the reverse order that the brain developed from birth. So basically, um, when we were born, did we know how to use the toilet? Did we know how to use um, utensils properly? Did we know how to speak? We had to be taught all of that stuff. We had to be taught our vowels and our consonants. We had to be taught how to hold the fork properly. Um, we had to be taught how to be trained. Right? Um, and all of that stuff has kind of fallen away as somebody with Alzheimer's disease advances throughout, throughout the disease. Um, again, it's not a perfect theory, um, but it's, it's a framework some framework that people have or that you can use. And again, um, dementia affects everybody differently. Um, so the disease will change. Some of the symptoms will change. Some of the behaviors will change. Um, and our loved ones cannot help that. Um, it's just part of the disease. So we, as the family unit, the friends, the caregivers, um, have to be flexible and change with those, change with the disease as well. And this is one of my favorite quotes for caregivers in general. 
the ordinary arts and practice every day at home are more important to the soul than their simplicity might suggest. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> is that it? That's that it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. I learned a lot today. Good. Oh, I'm sorry, I just don't.